There are some other stories, though, involving this race. And earlier, our pit reporter, Greg Kramer, and our expert commentator, David Hobbs, filed these reports. Prior to this event, Sylvan Trembley had two, three pole positions and two wins in his Mazda RX-7 Turbo, but that was on the wide open circuits like Watkins Glen and Road Atlanta. Sylvan, the streets here are anything but wide and sweeping. Is that turbo going to be a problem for you here? It definitely, it's, it hurts us because we don't have the grunt of the V8 power cars like the Mustangs and the Firebirds. So our car is light and nimble, and I hope that it helps us in the twisty stuff. Uh, you know, we did a lot of testing on the fast sweeping stuff, and that's what we've had our victories, and we've done the best. Uh, this is my second time on a street course. A lot more learning to do, and we'll just see. Hopefully the weekend will unroll, and we can keep our momentum going. That's a big thing in this sport is momentum. Well, he seems pretty confident. Over to you, Greg. Well, David, this is something you don't see very often, a team owner that's right down there making sure the car's pretty as well as fast. This is Paul Hacker, who, of course, with his brother, have made up the Hacker Express over the years. This is your second season driving Fords in the M's Endurance Championship. Must feel good to be a part of what Ford is accomplishing, particularly this year. This year has been a really great year for Ford. Last year was a pretty good year for the Hacker Express. Uh, my brother and I, with our zero car, the car that we're not running this weekend, uh, accomplished more miles than anybody else in um, IMSA Endurance with one specific car. Many teams have more than one car and jump from car to car. Uh, this year we created a new car, the double zero, and uh, I'm trying it out this weekend. And uh, we were fourth in that first qualifying stint, and uh, it looks like it's going to be good. The new car may be better than the old car. Well, it sure looks nice, but i got to tell you, Paul, you missed a spot. Uh. Come on, Greg, give the guy a break, please. I'm here with the first IMSA Endurance Champions to be crowned this year. Eric Van Cleef, winner of the Sports Division. Tell us how you feel about clinching the championship by virtue of your pole position and the one point that that gives you. Well, I tell you what, Calvin, it feels great. Uh, we came down here really not expecting to get the pole. Um, you know, we didn't think the car would be that good at a tight circuit like this. The front-wheel drive cars have a little better um, acceleration off the corners. But, uh, it, you know, we got here, and, and the car was wonderful. Being a rear-wheel drive car, we were able to dance the car through the corners, and, and we're just having a lot of fun and able to put it on the pole. It feels great. Six wins this year so far and a couple more to go. What are your plans for 1997? Um, you know, clinching the championship here, we're really hoping to uh, move up into a Super Turbo for um, Grand Sports next year. We'd like to be the first team to do that. We think we can win some races there. And, uh, you know, I'm a loyal Toyota supporter. I think they got a great car, and I'd like to stick with them. Good luck today. Thank you very much, Callan. The streets and access roads around the Reunion Arena here in Dallas have been turned into a 1.3-mile, nine-turn road course and mix in these factors. A narrow racetrack, 52 cars, and rain as we take a look at the, the starting grid. Once again, Tremblay qualified for the pole, his fourth of the year, but his teammate Vardy will start that car. In the second outside that uh, front row will be Doug Goad. In the second row, Jason Priestley and his Mustang out of Hollywood, California. And uh, Bernie Cochran will start outside the second row. In the third row, it's Stu Hayner and Steve Pepper. In the fourth row, Chuck Cottrell and Rob Walton. And in the uh, fifth row, it's uh, Bennett Durant and Craig Conway. As we take a look at the rest of the starting lineup, the top 16 drivers are in the Grand Sport class, 21 of the top 24. But David Hobbs, we actually have four divisions running in this one event. compact as they take the green flag. As you said earlier, it's going to be very, very slick here on the streets of Dallas. This is actually a huge car park, the area they're going through at the moment. And this is turn one, as you can see, very, very tight. And I expect there's been a lot of indecision this afternoon as to what tires for these guys to use because they obviously use street radials. Most of the time they're shaved down because you get a much better grip on a dry track. But if it's going to rain a lot and we hear there's big rain coming, a lot of them will choose to go on the full groove tire. Scenario because it's really intermittent right now. Before the off, the drivers were really in uh, conjecture with the crew chief as to what tires to run, whether to go with the dry tires or a full or a full wet. And uh, this is the worst case scenario for drivers. This is going to be a three-hour event. They don't want to have to pit early and change tires. They hope that they made the right decision. But the weather forecast is calling for first intermittent rain. You can see it's starting to rain harder now. And just before the green flag fell, the report was heavy rain on the west side of Dallas. Very heavy rain. That should make the decision to go to the uh, rain tires easier. I think so. I mean, obviously, it's better to try and baby some rain tires under these conditions and try and get around on uh, almost slick racing tires. 
admittedly they're down like two or three 30 seconds which gives them a little bit of uh, a groove to disperse the water but essentially a slick racing tire here and here we're watching Jason Priestley really go after that car in front of him this is a good battle right now with the yeah, Priestley in that uh, white number 46 Mustang goes around Bernie Cochran in the uh, burgundy number three Priestley has really impressed a lot of folks so often an actor in a Hollywood uh, gets a taste of racing through some celebrity events and because they Ooh, have go racing uh, they're not always that competitive but he's been very impressive with his learning curve. Wow, we've seen some more overtaking there. The number three car of uh, Burnell Cochran slipping back to the field here. 46 car, as you say, Priestley, of course, the absolute shining example of Hollywood stardom behind the wheel being Paul Newman, who didn't start racing until he was 46, actually turned out to be a pretty good, in fact, an extremely good race driver. Would have done just as well as a race driver as he does as an actor, I think, if he started earlier. They Priestley. pull up uh, along what is Interstate 35. This is an access road. Stu Hayner there, I think, uh, making a move on Jason Priestley there as we get around this uh, first couple of laps here. And uh, Jason is doing a good, solid job. He's holding down third position right now and doing a solid job. Scott Maxwell is his co-driver for the last two or three events. And he's really uh, put Jason uh, up to speed now. And it's good when you get a good co-driver alongside. It really brings the most out of you. Upper right of your screen, you can see the Reunion Arena, the home of the uh, Dallas Mavericks. There's a big banner hanging on the arena saying the Dallas Mavericks under construction. They They've had some lean years down here. Uh, they've made some personnel changes. Now they come down Hotel Street, which is the fastest part of this racetrack before going to a very tight right-hander past the start-finish line and negotiate their way through a, what had been a parking lot, this track being designed by Alan Wilson of Wilson Motorsports. He is the husband of race driver Desiree Wilson, and Alan has designed a number of the temporary courses, like the one in Columbus and in Denver and uh, Minnesota, as well as here in Dallas. He's right done, I'm sorry. Thanks. He's done a pretty good job here. See, it's a, it's a, it's compact. This course is, it's jammed into between the freeways. You can see, you've got freeways on one side, and railway on the other. There's the 13 car. That is Bill Black and Joe Kent driving the Oldsmobile Achiever. So that might bring out. Let's hope it doesn't. But it could bring out a full course caution. But they're right in the middle of the, the fastest part of this racetrack. It's right and sweet. Uh, as it goes along the uh, side of uh, I-35 there, and it's uh, a bit narrow. Unlucky 13 for Black. Black is in the cockpit. He was the starting driver. You can see the damage to both the front and the back. As you can see, the rain now harder. Look at the front of number 25. A lot of front end damage to uh, Danaher's touring car number 25. Yeah, that's he might be uh, shedding some parts along the roadway. Well, luckily they're Honda parts, and I know just the place where he can go and replace those with. Let me guess. Somebody in this booth must have a Honda store someplace in this I country. I can't imagine who, but I know it's not Gary Lee, and I know it's not Calvin. But <laughs> it's a long way to Milwaukee, though. Hopefully there's one a little closer. Hopefully you'll Whoa! Just tight there. You can see the uh, corner workers signaling to the drivers. You'll see a yellow flag, but these corner workers do an excellent job of giving as much information to the drivers when there's a problem at And of course, the visibility down to uh, a minimal right now as we're going to take this break and come back with more rain and more racing from Dallas. Gary Lee along with David Hobbs, Greg Kramer, and Calvin Fish here in Dallas as we take a look at that uh, track description, David. Well, as you can see, going into turn one, very, very tight, uh, narrow corner, so a lot of bunching up going into there. Downhill down to turn two, which is a fast right-hand sweeper. Then three, four, five, and six, as you can see, a very, very tight sort of chicane there. But then out of six, we got another downhill run through, seven and eight, sevens, where we just saw the Oldsmobile Achiever hit the wall. So that's a quick right-hand sweep. And uh, down to eight and nine. Nine's very interesting because it's got brick overlay and concrete and asphalt, and it's very, very, very off camber. Slippery as old Nick, I think, in the daylight today. And then out of nine, you've got a bit of an uphill climb, and then uh, finally across the start finish line where there's a very big bump just before that finish line. So, uh, all in all, a pretty interesting combination for these guys this afternoon. Well, the uh, Bill Black Oldsmobile Achiever has been pulled off the race course. That is the reason we have this uh, yellow right now, as you can see. Uh, the rain has let up ever so slightly, but the track is slick. There is some concern, guys, about some ponding out there, which are very dangerous. Well, it's tough, especially when you've got this much traffic out there and you change line and you may be on a part of the racetrack that you haven't encountered before, and suddenly if there's a lot of standing water, you obviously lose your steering momentarily. So uh, 
it's really tough for these guys that are there right now, but they probably realize there's going to be a lot of caution periods with this type of conditions on a street circuit. And uh, the name of the game is just to maintain position, obviously not go a lap down and try and be there for the last hour or so. Joe Vardy will lead under yellow as we go back to racing. And Joe, a winner of 23 events here in IMSA competition. He is now uh, second in uh, make that third in the point standings out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, formerly of uh, Tampa, Florida. Because the other like thing, that, like any any wet race, of course, one of the big problems, especially for the guys towards the back, of course, is spray. I mean, they just kick up the most inordinate amount of spray, and uh, as you can see, of course, these are street stops, so they do have windscreen wipers, but still and all, they get hot inside, and they tend to mist up, and then, of course, it's very difficult for the driver then once they start to mist up. You can see the uh, 32 car there in second position. That's Stu Hayner that started that car. Stu's one of the most experienced guys out here today, and I'm sure he's seen it all, including street circuits and uh, including wet weather. So he'll be one to watch. Very experienced, very wily in these uh, in these cars, and uh, he's probably going to try and put some pressure on Vardy right now and see if he can make him make a mistake early. Well, Stu's teammate John Heinrichsy is now leading the point standings for Grand Sports in the 32 Pontiac. In fact, right now there's a good battle between Ford and Pontiac for the Manufacturers' Cup. The Ford showing 166 points, Pontiac 153. Of course, Pontiac won the manufacturer's title last year. This is that uh, turn three. That's turn three there at the top of the picture. This is four that is going through here. This is three, four, five, and six. And the restarts in this race are going to be at turn six, which you might think is a slightly odd position to have it. But the field's all going to be bunched up in this chicane so that we won't get uh, everybody arriving down at turn eight all at the same time. So uh, the idea of that, of course, is to get the field slowed up through uh, three, four, five. We heard the earlier comments from uh, Sylvain Tremblay about not thinking that turbo was a great advantage in this racetrack, but then after qualifying yesterday, he kind of liked the idea of having the turbo because he said it really uh, shot the car off the corner. He got some good uh, bite and a good thrust off these tight corners. I mean, obviously seems to be working very well in the rain. Of course, that is a twin turbo, so they get good progressive power input, but it's uh, even so. In a wet day like today, Joe Vardy's doing a heck of a job with that twin turbo motor up front. There you see them going into that 89 complex. You can just see how off camera it is. This is that big bump right there. Look over the thing. They almost get airborne there in the dry. They probably do. But that's a place where it could puddle up too if it rains a lot. Of course, the organizers have to shake their head. This has been one of the driest summers on record here in the uh, Lone Star State. So we come to Labor Day weekend and we have uh, a gully washer. That's right. And uh, right now what you're seeing the drivers do is experiment with their line around the racetrack. Typically the racing line is the slickest when you have wet conditions. A lot of oil and rubber is uh, laid down. Down there obviously on a street circuit is only used one time a year is not such a factor but we saw Jill breaking in the middle of the track there for turn one feeling there's a little more fire. You can see the five car going through that's uh, Rob Walton streaming through this turn four it's a pretty tight chicane here you can see that the uh, rain they've all got rain tires because they're sucking up the water there. they're all leaving tire tracks but they're just hoping like heck I'm sure that the rain is going to go away but as you can see it's raining pretty hard now but during that yellow we had wholesale pit stops and we've got a spin right there car number 94 that's Lean Fulton and Carl Hulcher from uh, Dallas from Arizona in their Honda Accord but a number of these race teams chose to, to start the race on the shade tire. Went about three laps, the yellow came out, and they were all in to change the, uh, the full tread. That's right, you lose so much ground when it gets a lot of water on the track when you're effectively running on slicks that, I mean, you're really going to lose seconds and seconds per lap. It's a three-hour event, and uh, we actually saw the number one car of Andy Pilgrim come in and uh, make some changes to his car, so he was obviously willing to uh, let go of some track uh, position there in exchange for getting a car that's going to handle better for the remainder of the three hours. Well, of course, it is a long race, so obviously you can get handling, but boy, oh boy, it is a long race, and look at the lead that Joe Vardy has got already. This is the car that uh, Silver Trent they were telling me at the top of the show he was a bit worried about it being uh, not suited to the street course not as a street course now it's a wet street course you'd think just the worst thing that for a twin turbo and look at the ground he's putting on that second place car now the twin turbo really can guzzle the fuel and uh, first of all we talked to Tremblay he said well maybe if we have lots of yellows we could go on one stop so if he can well, this big of an advantage for one stop it's going to be their race to win and of course the rain too will help them with their fuel they won't use anything like the fuel in the rain as they would in the dry because in spite of the fact that he's pulling away he's still not using the fuel he would do if it's dry look at the field packing up priestley's getting uh, some heat right there from bernie 
Cochran having a look Cochran down the, on the inside. inside. But, uh, different lines there, and you can see he's down the inside, and it may be Jason a chance let to it Jason. Go. Jason let him through there, obviously wise. He just wants to keep track position. He's got a great cool driver sitting in the pit. Scott Maxwell is extremely fast, and uh, if Jason can just hold it down in the top ten in this early going, they should be in good shape for the rest of the world. What were you saying about uh, Maxwell having to uh, slow him? Oh, we've got some problems on the left front of car number 33. That's uh, Mike Weinberg and Joe Aquilani there. So obviously they had severe contact with the wall somewhere around the racetrack. Terry McDonald started that car. Okay, and we're looking at Jason Priestley once again. I think he may be down to fourth position right now. I think we saw uh, the numbers. Uh, Cochran went by him for uh, third. Now he's coming under pressure from the five car, which is being driven by Rob Walton. Rob Walton, of course, of the uh, Walmart family, as uh, he's up there in the fifth position right now as uh, we take a look at the rain. And the top five in the Grand Prix of Dallas on a wet Labor Day weekend. Back now in Dallas, as you see the work continuing on number 33. As we went to break, we showed you the uh, left front damage to Terry McDaniel's car. And uh, we'll go back now and take a look at what transpired on the race course. You can see right there, she got high coming through that right-hander, a sweeping right-hander, made contact. So the work continues in the pit lane. Well, I'm down here standing by with Terry. Terry, what happened out there? There's a car in the wall. I think he put some oil down. And on the restart, Steve was into the wall the exact same place, and I came through. And I guess I got in the oil or the slipperiness, and the car just tracked out. I couldn't do it, and it tagged the wall. Good to be a part of this Aqualotti Motorsports team, because they're thinking they're going to get you back out. Yeah, they'll get me back out, and hopefully we'll finish in the top ten now. It's really slippery out there. Obviously, a car getting into the wall and oiling the track even worse, all that much more serious, as you can see. Well, Terry started back in the 16th position in the number 33 uh, Grand Sport entry, and I think that was an understatement when she said the track is slippery. You can see the cars really slipping and sliding, and obviously uh, when you see the cars coming around there like that, those guys behind the wheel and girls are very busy and uh, just trying to keep it off the concrete. They want to try and survive this thing. It's, uh, you know, when you're running this close together, you have one guy get out of shape, it can really have a concertina effect on everyone, and we see Giovanni now really having to work a heavy, heavy traffic there, and uh, this is difficult. The vision for everyone, particularly from behind, and the mirrors and stuff is almost non-existent there and for the leaders to come through under these conditions he really has to step very carefully and of course as is so much, so often the case in this type of racing traffic i feel sure will play a major part in this race and as you said joe Vardy is having to step very carefully with his traffic well into lap traffic now so he is going to be in traffic for the next two and a half hours as this race progresses there's just no way he's not going to be in traffic from now on andy pilgrim called this track mentally demanding this morning in our first rain, it stopped. It was very, very humid here. I thought it's going to be a physically demanding race as well. I'm not sure how warm it is out right now, but right now it has to be both physically and mentally demanding because these guys are watching their mirrors. They can't see that well because of the spray. They're watching in front of them. They can't see the car in front because of the spray. It's, it's really like tippy-toe around this racetrack. Well, the balance really changes from physical to mental because the physical side of driving, obviously, the G-forces and the heavy braking has gone away under these conditions. You can see Joe, they're almost getting pinched into the wall. But on the mental side, the concentration that you have to have driving your own car, then reading the traffic and uh, people making mistakes and everything else, and also the strategy in the pits, that's mental as well, making the right calls as to when to come in. And uh, there's going to be a great race. You can see Joe here really working the traffic once again. We had a chance to visit with Eric Van Cleef earlier, who clinched the title in the sport division by virtue of that one point that he received for being the fast qualifier. Let's also mention that uh, John Green was the fast qualifier in touring. That's his fourth pole of the year and his uh, 15th of the season, or of the, his career, I should say. And also uh, David Daugherty was the fast qualifier in the compact class. We do have some debris on the racetrack. The number 40 uh, Honda earlier made contact with the wall and left some of, some of the rear of the car along the concrete wall. Now, some of that debris could be a bit of a problem because if you pick it up in the treaded tires, it could work its way through the tire and obviously cause a puncture, which is not something you want here. But there you get an idea of that spray. I mean, it is going to get real thick. There's the debris on the outside there. In fact, there looks like a bit more debris than there was there before. 
I think that's from Terry McDonald's car when she uh, actually tagged the wall there coming off that turn. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how long the IMSA officials allow this race to continue because if one of the other cars gets out there, you're obviously going to cut down a tire and have more damage. Well, that one big piece is from the number 40 uh, Honda Prelude uh, that, that Brown made contact with the wall early on and, and drove away. But uh, you're right. The big question mark is how long can they continue one with the conditions from Mother Nature as well as the debris on the racetrack. But uh, Joe Vardy continues to lead the parade here in a very wet Dallas. 57 vet, huh? Of course, you got a lens cap from a 56, but you did know that, didn't you? And you got a little bit of a gap over here, and you got a ding in your chrome. God, it hurts me to see that. So now I got to ask myself, what's under the towel? Duct tape? Speed Vision Network. Motorheads live here. The Grand Prix of Dallas continues under the most ominous conditions as the rain continues to fall. Joe Vardy right there in the uh, Turbo Mazda continues to lead. Uh, his teammate, Selvin Tremblay, qualified for his fourth pole of the year, but Vardy started the race, and uh, if uh, they can continue on at reduced speeds and through some more yellows, that car may only make one pit stop and make the driver change. And then uh, Tremblay would look for his uh, third victory of the year as they come down the Hotel Street past the pit lane where Greg Creamer is standing by with the, a couple of racing tires. Well, indeed, what we've got here is what these teams use for a wet tire and a dry tire. Unlike series that race on slicks that have a completely different compound with grooves cut into it, in this series, it's the same tire. It's just got a different tread depth. This would be the ray or the dry tire down to about two to three thirty seconds of an inch. You can see a lot of contact patch, not a lot of groove. You move over to the wet tire. It's got a lot more channeling in it. And what it does is it channels the water out, even though it's the same compound. That's the secret to a successful rain tire, getting the, t the water out from underneath the tire so the car doesn't float on it. It's the same tire, just different tread depth. Now, I got to point out when number one, Doug Goat came in, of course, his co driver Andy Pilgrim leading in the points another thing you can do to get bite in the rain is get the car as soft as possible well they made the ultimate commitment they disconnected the rear bar if it dries up they could be in trouble right now they're looking pretty strong really now keep in mind that so often in a rain tire situation it is a softer compound they cannot run as long on the tire these are the same tires well of course they're all Toyo tires in this uh, in this series and these uh, soft, soft tires here are not a factor. These aren't really soft tread. They have a special uh, compound that's good in uh, wet weather, it's good in dry weather, it's good in hot, it's good in cold conditions. So we've got somebody else in the wall whose uh, tread did not grip too well. Hard to see what number that was. Was 73 or 78? 15. 15. <laughs> close. Well, that's close. Mike Fitzgerald and Charles Menendez. Uh, Ah, Charles Mendez, who used to drive in IMSA a long time ago. We see the Hacker Express going around, and interesting to know that that's, that car is already a lap down, so that shows the pace of Giovanni here today. He's really eating through this field, and uh, under these conditions, if he can get a lap up on most of the competitors, that would be a huge advantage early in the go. Oh, absolutely fantastic. And, uh, there's no doubt about it that Giovanni is doing a tremendous job in very difficult conditions, weaving his way through the traffic. And very, very experienced driver is our Giuseppe. Only one more race for this division before the season concludes, and that will be uh, down at Daytona in October. But John Heinrichsy right now leading the point standings for the 130 in Grand Sport. Andy Pilgrim is second, some 11 points back. And Joe Vardy is third with 114. So a good finish for Vardy today. And if uh, Heinrichsy and Pilgrim had some trouble, then it would uh, put Vardy in a good position to maybe take that title at Daytona. Here we see the number one car. He made that pit stop and is already back up to the third position. So as Greg mentioned, uh, they came in, they disconnected that rear roll bar, and he's obviously making a good steady progress because he's back up to the third position, chased hard by the number three car of Cochrane. Jason Priestley has a big motor home here this weekend. He's kind of hiding after that. Right now he's probably thinking, you know, it'd be a lot more enjoyable. 
keeping that motor home. But what it is out here fighting with it. That's right. It's probably pretty miserable in that car. The biggest problem is the vision, as David mentioned. Not only just seeing, you know, the, the spray and everything, but typically you get a lot of condensation on the inside. And uh, that's the driver's nightmare when you can't see where you're going between these walls around this Dallas track. Some of these cars are rear drive. Some are front drive. Both you guys, veteran race drivers, an observation on uh, your preference. Well, I must say that I prefer the rear wheel drive with conditions like this. Front drive cars, of course, make for a very compact uh, engine transmission, a good uh, transaxle, great for production, and uh, good in snow. But when it comes to conditions like this, uh, I prefer the rear wheel drive. Now, that just might be something because I drove race cars with rear wheel drive for 30 odd years. And uh, I, I find it difficult to come to grips with the front wheel drive cars. But of course, the modern front drive cars, when they modify them for racing, they're, they're pretty uh, useful too. You started driving race cars when the wheels had wooden spokes, didn't you? Exactly. A long time ago. Look at this traffic as they come down the back side of the circuit. Unbelievable. You see the number one car and the number three there trying to fight the way. And uh, Goat goes to the outside. Contact right there in that right hander as the rain continues to fall. As we take a look now at the, the top runners here at the Grand Prix of Dallas, and once again, Marty continues to lead. Now, just past 45 minutes into a three hour endurance race, you can see some body parts down there on that race course. And there's a look at Jason Priestley, who has made a pit stop after an altercation on the racetrack. As we take a look now at what happened a couple of laps ago, Chris Scavney's. Gets to the inside of Priestley's number 46. There's contact right there. Turns Jason to the wall. And uh, he is able to uh, continue on as he's pushed all the way around. He made the pit stop, came in to check the damage. And uh, I'm wondering why they didn't refuel the car while he was in. Well, we asked that question of the crew chief, and they said basically they didn't want to go down a lap by topping the car off. Remember, they're getting around here fairly quick, something just uh, over a minute, 15, minute, 20 seconds or so. They didn't want to go down a lap, and they think they can do it. Well, they're sure, actually, now they can do it on one stop. So they said, we're not going to feel we're going to do that while we do the driver's change. It was just a quick check and let them go, stay on the lap, try and make up some ground. And you can see the very, very slight damage. So I question it. Would that be driver inexperience as to why Jason Priestley came in? Well, the spin was uh, quite considerable. And probably from Jason's perspective, he felt the car hit the wall and crunched the wall. And he probably thought he had more damage than he did. But as we're looking at it right there on the left front corner, really didn't get into the tire or suspension. So he would have probably been better to stay out for that, feel the car out, see if there was any problems, and then make the pit stop rather than bringing it straight in. Well, it is remarkably unscathed because it was a pretty substantial belt he gave the wall. He had the other car jammed into his door for quite a long time there. So, I mean, yeah, a bit of an experience maybe, but on the other hand, I think I might have come in then too because you just don't know what damage has been done. If it's pushed the bodywork onto the tire, the next thing you know, the tire's cut you know, two thirds of the way around the racetrack. You've got to stack it back. That's right. If you had to cut the tire down, we'd have said that was an experience for an operator. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Guy just can't win, That's can right. he? It's the okay. trouble being a rookie. But I tell you what, still he has been impressive all in all. He's uh, learned well. He's had a good uh, teacher in Scott Maxwell, who you got a glimpse of there in the pit lane waiting to come in on the driver change. And he'll drive the uh, last leg. And, you made an observation earlier. We talked about making pit stops. And usually this would be a two-stop race. But uh, as we talked to Tremblay before the race, he said with weather conditions, a lot of yellows, the lead car driven by Vardy now should make it on one stop. And that could indicate uh, that all these cars could make it on one stop. Well, we want. We watch uh, once again uh, Jason Priestley, who uh, continues his learning curve. And uh, earlier this weekend, I know that uh, we had a chance to uh, send Greg Creamer over to uh, the pit area, visit with uh, Jason Priestley about uh, his learning curve this season as a rookie here in the MSA Endurance Championship Series. Back races really compress the schedule, and you're seeing a little bit of a Mosport memory being cleaned up by Jason Priestley's crew. And I'm standing by with Jason Priestley, who moved into road racing from rally racing last year. And Jason, you've established yourself in this division. Now Scott Maxwell, a very talented driver, has joined the team since Sears Point. You've got to feel good about your chances for the rest of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Scotty came on board uh, for starting at Sears Point, and uh, we were real competitive there. We were real competitive last week at Mosport. Ended up finishing fifth, but. Uh, I think we had the fastest car out there, and a little bit of bad luck hurt us late in the race, but uh, we should be real competitive here today. Well, they were certainly competitive in most sports. Right up front, stayed there most of the 
You know, so often when somebody comes into a series uh, from a background like Jason Priestley, we, we look at him as a racing actor. But I think at some point in time with the progress he's made, we can kind of drop the actor and say he's here to race. He doesn't want to sign autographs as a, as a Hollywood star. He wants to sign autographs as a race driver. That's right, and he's really doing a great job. And uh, one point on that Marsport race, they were actually leading the race, came in for a pit stop. We see the number 37 there. I think that may be the McNeely machine as uh, we turn around. Actually, that's Joe Aquilani and Jim McCallion in that car today. Uh, but at Marsport, they are leading the race. They came in and they left the fill cap off during the pit stop, and they were leading the race. Had to come back and put that on, and then he had a speed limit infraction down the pit lane, which was 25 miles an hour there because of the very tight confines of the Marsport pit lane so uh, they really lost out on a great result potentially there at most for last week yeah that's just one of those things uh, not putting the fuel cap on you obviously can't blame jason Priestley for that going through the pit lane a bit quick it was a very very low speed limit very hard to adjust to such a low speed limit but an extremely narrow pit lane up there in most the speed limit here this weekend is 45 miles an hour that really shouldn't be a problem because uh, when they make pit stops a bit later in this event uh, they're going to slow the racetrack anyway that shouldn't be a problem getting into 45 you see Con, uh, Conquer really got wide there coming through the fast right hander there and the number two car of uh, Conway has gone underneath him as they break down for that tight right hander. Great Conway on the inside that the red number two. Bernie Cochran in the uh, burgundy number three as they come down the hotel street. Obviously meeting the fill window is going to be the strategy we're talking about right now, but before the race under dry conditions, everyone was talking about brakes, long, fast straightaways, heavy braking zones. Everyone was thinking about braking, and I spoke to Scott Maxwell before the race, and he said that if they had a yellow, their concern was boiling the brakes on a pit stop. So he said they were potentially thinking about running around behind the pace car for two or three laps if they got a caution period before bringing it in. Ideally, you'd want to bring it in as soon as you can to regain that track position, but uh, they were willing to sacrifice that so that they did not boil the brakes on the pit. Well, what had turned out to be intermittent showers earlier today, now a steady downpour here in Dallas as the race continues. And once again, Joe Varney continues to lead the way. Gary Lee along with David Hobbs, Greg Creamer, and Calvin Fish back at the uh, streets of Dallas in the Grand Prix of Dallas as we take a look now at uh, the top 20. And right now we can tell you that Joe Vardy continues a 27 second lead. So he has been command from uh, the opening green and uh, this race has been contested under very wet conditions. Another car off course. Number seven Mazda in trouble down there. And that's that is Brad uh, Krieger. Brad Krieger. He was running in fifth position. So obviously that's uh, quite an important factor there. He's obviously stalled the car unable to uh, get it moving right now. We see a corner worker helping him out there. Now on replay, this is what happened. Tries the high side and a uh, little contact right there. A little more than a little contact. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Looked like the 34 car was having some problems and the seven went around the outside. 34 obviously didn't know he was there and basically shoved him out wide and spun him around. But uh, he momentarily stalled the car, but he's underway again and uh, probably kept it in the top 10 with the spacing out of the cars right now. That was Steve Pfeffer in the uh, 34 car that Twisting around there, you can see that rear wheel drive there, the fish tailing as he comes off the turn six there and starts off down this pretty long uh, straightaway. You can see a little bit of damage to the left side of the car there, and now we're watching the battle for uh, third There and fourth, is uh, Doug Goad in the uh, number one car. That's the car that qualified outside the front row, and the uh, team driver, Andy Pilgrim, right now second the point standings, and he is waiting for that pit stop to take over the driving chores. I think Andy's just a little bit anxious, too. It's getting close to that window. Andy, first of all, you've got, uh, I think at most part, your 38th consecutive finish in four years. Doug Goat, it's his 100th start in IMSA uh, showroom stock competition. In these kind of conditions, having that kind of experience in the car before you get in has to feel good. Yeah, it does. Dougie's doing a great job so far. He's keeping the car in one piece. Being, he's been real conservative in traffic. We've got to do that. We have to be conservative. We've got to finish. And in these conditions, a finish is a victory for anybody. Points really key for you, obviously. Uh, strategy has to play a role here, too. You're getting, we're just past the hour mark. What are you guys thinking? Well, we're getting close to what we call our fuel window. When he comes, when Dougie comes in, I'm getting in the car and going. But uh, it's just 
you've just got to take every corner as it comes in these kind of conditions. You've just got to be really, really careful. And again, we can't stress enough, points are such a concern. And uh, David and Calvin, when you're driving in the wet, sometimes don't you run a higher gear to get uh, eliminate wheel spin? That can help with uh, your fuel economy, can it? Well, of course, when you're driving a specialized race car, you can do that sort of thing. But obviously, it didn't start raining until lunchtime. And it's a bit late for these guys to, to go changing the final drive. They will be using a lot less power and a lot less horsepower than they would if it was dry. So their fuel consumption should not be a problem this afternoon. Their biggest problem now is that number two car, Craig Conway, who's come up from 10th on the grid. So he's now challenging that number one car that's been co-driven by Andy Pilgrim. So the Craig Conway car coming right up there. To show you how competitive this series is, last season Andy Pilgrim won the title and won six races. He has yet to find victory lane this season. It really is very competitive. There's so many cars that can win on any given weekend, and uh, you have someone of Andy's caliber and the team that's behind him to be this far in the season with only two races left here and in Daytona, and uh, they still haven't won a race this year. It's incredible. The battle for uh, third and fourth. It's Craig Conway in the red number. Craig Conway seemed to make up some ground there, didn't he, in the traffic. Now they've number broken two. free of traffic. Uh, Doug Goad is pulling away again, but I tell you what, I think this rain's getting worse. Don't you think uh, Calvin is looking pretty hairy now? We're getting a lot of, look, a lot of see ponding, a lot of the ponding there. Very and, nice. uh, so that's going to bring out some aquaplaning. Luckily, they're not going really super fast there. Woo, you see uh, Conway there getting really fishtailing on the brake. So conditions start to deteriorate rapidly for these guys. Another thing that's going to happen is a three-hour race. It never was scheduled to finish till 6.30, by which time here in Dallas at this time of the year, it's getting pretty gloomy anyway. Uh, obviously, with this intense cloud cover, by the time 6.30 comes down, it's going to be very gloomy out there. I have to ask, we're seeing some drivers, as we have right here, the number one car with the, the lights on. Why aren't we seeing all the lights on? I'm not sure, actually. If I was out there, I must say I'd have my lights on if I was in one of the quick cars, like the, the, the number one guy. To the guy in front. Exactly. To warn people team. that you're coming up to lap that you were coming up on. He got very wide there coming through, I believe, uh, turn three, and um, almost got it in the tyres there. But he's obviously pushing hard. He's under a lot of pressure from behind, and they can't let the allow those leaders to get too far ahead. Do you know what I mean? Wallace, whilst it keeps going green like this, normally you just want to keep the leaders in sight. You're planning on a few cautions, but right now we're getting a lot of green flag racing, and uh, the leaders are gradually stretching it out. Well, you're watching that battle for third right now. Doug Goad in the uh, number one Firebird Formula running in third position. Has uh, pressure from behind in the number two car with Craig Conway. So that's the best battle right now on the racetrack as they battle for third position, but Barty continues to lead. The fastest car in the touring class now in pit lane. It's not a routine stop. Mark Hine had been the starting driver. John Green qualified that car uh, fast in that class, but let's look at what happened to the black number 38. He looked like he just aquaplaned there under braking. He was coming down on the right side, trying to overtake some traffic, and he really made heavy contact with a wall there on the right side, and that's the side we saw them working on in the pit lane. Well, Greg Creamer is down there for uh, an update on the problem with car 38. Thanks very much, Gary. I'm standing by with number 38's driver at the time, Mark Hine. And, Mark, what happened on it one? Uh, I was coming up on 41 to take over second place. And I think I took too big a bite. I was catching him four seconds a lap. I should have hung back. But I got bumped by him as I was going by. And as soon as he bumped me, I started a hydroplane. And I just took a shot to the wall. It bent the rear toe link. If it wasn't for that, I think we'd have been all right. I could have kept going. But that's just life, you know? Those things happen. It was my fault. I shouldn't have tried to take that big a bite. Should have taken second been happy with it. All right, however, the crew not giving up. They've already got another wheel back on. John Green on board. Going to send him back out and see what they can salvage. You know, you have to tip your hat to the crew. The driver climbs out. He stayed fairly dry in the cockpit. He can walk over. Another problem on the racetrack. He can walk over to a shelter someplace. And the poor crew guys are out there with no shelter, no protection. Climbing under that race car is a miserable day. It's bad enough to be in the cockpit. It's miserable for those guys working on the car. Oh, it really is. You've got to take your hat off to Mark Hine, too, who admitted he made a mistake. So many drivers uh, would have obviously blame the other car there. Well, here is the best battle right now on the racetrack, and that is for, uh, what, third position? Or that is, uh, no, it's for second position. 
and that's Stu Hayner in the 32 car and uh, Doug Gold uh, really putting the pressure on now he's really made up a lot of ground because Stu had quite a big lead there between second and third spot and uh, Gold is really on the move now and uh, they're going to try and get bear in mind that the guys who are going to take over these cars are the guys who are battling for the championship Heinrich will get in that 32 car and Pilgrim will get in the one so this is a uh, very important in the championship battle right now coming up to some lap traffic in the very poor part of the racetrack here to get around it where the road moves right left right left a guy there moving out to let the faster traffic through that's pretty good of him too and he's in terrible conditions and of course we don't see craig conway anymore where he was in that two car right behind him a few months ago so what strategy dictates since these guys are their teammates which you say are in the points battle would they likely pit at the same time and let the pit crews go at each other well, it's really going to be interesting. I mean, there's so many things going on right now. I mean, how much fuel they're burning up with the wet conditions, uh, if they're going to get a lot of yellow. I mean, I'm sure the crew chiefs are really working overload right now on uh, when to bring these cars in, but we're getting a lot of green flag racing, and these cars are going to have to pit. I mean, there's a point where you have to bring it in and not run out of fuel. So we should see that within the next 20, 30 minutes, of these cars having to pit, even if there is a yellow condition, because they need to get some fuel in. They can't afford to run out around here and uh, lose a lot of track position for one of these championship contenders so they have to be a little conservative well of course these two obviously aren't going to run each other off the road there's no doubt about it as they are you know team cars on the other hand if the number one car there being driven by uh, doug goat thinks he can get around um he will do Right. But he's going to be careful about how he does He's it. not going to force the issue. I don't think so. He gets really wide going through oh, yeah. there. And I tell you what, it's like he's got a lot of understeer. We mentioned the fact that we disconnected the roll bar on that car, and that will, uh, you know, obviously induce a lot of understeer in the vehicle. It seems in the low speed stuff that he's actually got an understeer where the car's pushing straight ahead. But with the rear roll bar disconnected, it will put the power down better as he comes off the turn. So it's really a compromise on the settings there. Well, it's just one of those things when you come in and disconnect the, the rear, rear bar or the front bar, whichever you decide to disconnect, obviously there's, it's a, it is a big gamble. You just don't know what's going to happen. There's a 94 car that we saw spin earlier on. 75, that's the compact car of uh, Chris Gaffney. He's the champion of the uh, compact division last year. In fact, that car started 38th, and they're up to 8th overall. What that really indicates is that some of these compact cars are a lot easier to drive under these conditions because they put the power to the ground very effectively. And down in the pits, Greg Kramer has a story. Greg? Hi. Yeah, here we go. I'm standing by with Dave Dottery. And Dave, you put that car on the pole. And I think it's like your fifth pole of the season. It's been a great year for you that way. Talk about a great race. Starting, as they just said, in the booth back in something like 30th. You're running well into the top 10. What a great drive. Yeah, well, not exactly the car I qualified. Actually, this is the car Christian, qual Christian Scavnis qualified. And he has, he has given it a spirited drive. The little Nissan 200 is coming through the pack. And it's running with all the big cars. It's pretty exciting. Why is that exactly, that a car that normally would be that much further back in the rain on a track like this could be so competitive? Front wheel drive. I'll tell you, that little front wheel drive is hooked up today in the rain. Um, the ABS, the car is so good. You know, wet traction, snow, it, it's good. Obviously, it's good, doing very well. Of course, you're going to be getting in a different car. Uh, where's that place right now? Yeah, I'm not sure which car I'm going to get in right now, but I'll probably get in the 76 car, and we'll try to move it back up from about six, try to get her in the top three. All right, David Dottery looking for some points. I was going to have him say hello to David because we used to race go-karts together about 20-some years ago. <laughs> My goodness, was a pretty How fair go-kart driver. <laughs> His career went Well, the rain he continues to fall and the race continues through the city streets here in Dallas. Speed Vision back at the Sprint Grand Prix of Dallas. Three-hour IMSA Endurance Championship. We have now reach the halfway point as you watch the rear of the white number 46 of Jason Priestley and uh, he got tagged a couple of laps back he's getting a real education here in the rain now this is uh, Hayner behind him in car 32 we well, tagged him in the braking zone there obviously Jason was braking a little earlier than Hayner or Hayner misjudged his braking there and just pushed him out a little wide and uh, sort of NASCAR style there moves underneath him Jason Priestley actually is doing a tremendous job because this is a very difficult racetrack. As you can see, a lot of heavy water lying there, so aquaplaning is a big problem this afternoon. Obviously, the grip factor is way down, and he's hanging right in there. I mean, uh, they started off in third position. He's back to 11th, but I still think he's, you know, for a relatively inexperienced race driver, he's hanging in very well on one 
extremely difficult condition. Yeah, he's doing a great job, and he has such a great attitude out of the car as well. He's really enjoying his racing, realizes that he's on a big learning curve, and uh, always praises his uh, teammate, Scott Maxwell, who's uh, typically been qualifying the car and putting out towards the front of the grid. Right now, Joe Vardy continues to lead. He has lengthened the lead to 41 seconds, but there is heavy traffic throughout this uh, racing facility, which is 1.3 miles in length, encompassing nine turns. The uh, roads and streets around the Reunion Arena here in Dallas. We can also tell you that uh, Greg Lavelle is now uh, leading the sports class at number 30. We also have uh, Gary Blackman in 31 leading touring. Scabney's in the number 75 car is now up to the lead in the compact division. One cheap party, you work through traffic once again there and uh Okay, and there he's behind the Mustang there, trying to work his way. And look at that Mustang get sideways as he went through that turn. And that's the problem for the leaders. I mean, not only are they trying to put their own power to the ground and keep the car under control, uh, some of these other cars are not handling as well. And uh, these cars can really turn you in the fence very quickly. By the way, gentlemen, speaking of cars that are handling well, you were just talking about the Speed Source Mazda with Joe Vardy behind the wheel, number 70. That's got a margin of some 45 seconds at this point working beautifully stop by and talk to Sylvain Tremblay very quickly he's concentrating getting ready to get in the car and it could come at any time they're in the window and I ask him what is the absolute outside here if we do not get a yellow how long can you go and he said about an hour 40 hour 45 minutes is our best guess that's pretty much what we're hearing from most of the grand sports teams right now so if we get a yellow within the next 10 15 minutes all the other cars the other three divisions are easily in that window this pit lane is going to get incredibly busy and that's what Tremblay will get in for Vardy and try and keep that car out front I must say it's uh, tremendous these drivers all deserve an accolade this afternoon I mean it's very very difficult conditions 50 odd cars packed into 1.3 mile and we've had virtually no yellow flag racing before it started. I was convinced we were going to have about 50% of this race was going to be under caution. There we see uh, Stu Hayner and Doug Go, the 32 and number one car, again battling for, for position. And these guys have actually been teammates before, so we mentioned earlier about whether they put each other off. They know their own game. They've worked very closely together. They've won races together, and I'm sure, I'm sure they know their own driving styles. Uh, very closely. How many times have we talked about the pit crew winning a race? And here's an example right here. If we don't get a yellow, we have green flag pit stops. It's going to be the crew who wins this race. Well, the fill window really could play a part right now because if we get to the point where, oh, and then now we see the number 70 coming in under green flag, and this is what I was then going to point out, if we have the other cars pitting under a caution, for example, if Vardy pits now under green, changes to Tremblay, and then the others get a yellow flag, this could turn things around. Well, the last clocking, we had him at 41 seconds in the lead, and uh, Greg Kramer is standing by to call this driver change. And you can see Vardy just heaves his seat pad. He's a little bit shorter than Tremblay, so they have to put a little seat pad in. He just heaves it over the wall, gets Tremblay in the car as quick as possible, and they're buckling up. Meanwhile, left rear corner going after the fuel and uh, loading this thing up. Again, the most thirsty car, but they're getting so much help from the yellows and, more importantly, the rain. Also, you can see putting a little bit of oil in the engine. That's something they always do with this car. They tend to uh, burn it just a little bit rich anyway, just to make sure they don't have problems. They've got the oil in, driver change is complete, and we're just waiting for the fuel to come down. Let's see, Vardy is, uh, see if we can get Joe. Joe, let me grab you here for just a second. Obviously, he's interested in how the pit stop goes. Joe, what a remarkable run. You had a margin of over some 40 seconds built up by the time you made this stop. Yeah, the car's running great. It's just handling real good in the rain, and everything's fine. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's just a lot of traffic out there, and we just got to be careful. Obviously, that's the key. Get to the finish, always. Well, Vardy is so versatile. Had a great ride last week at Mossport Park in a Viper, finished second in the GTS 1 class. He's really an expert in these type of vehicles and uh, moving up a category there last week, running the GTS 1 division, and they really pushed the, uh, pushed the old Aurora's very hard there at Mossport, where he was driving with Victor Sifton. So the pit crew, the one and only pit stop that we anticipate from this crew today. So uh, we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll figure out exactly where he is now in the race.